Ambassador Dermer, thanks for being with us on uh, CBN News. Pleasure to be with you, Chris. About a week ago, there were rockets that were fired toward Jerusalem. On Jerusalem Day, uh, Israel celebrating the reunification of the city. Here we are a week later. Tell us how we got to this point. Well, Hamas uh, uses Jerusalem as a pretext, just as they have used many pretexts in the past. They used pre uh, Jerusalem as a pretext last week to launch uh, rockets at the State of Israel. And frankly, Chris, what they're trying to do is take over from Abu Mazen and the Palestinian Authority. This is an internal Palestinian issue, and Israel is the canvas on which this is playing out. But the canvas is our people. It's our people who are being rocketed. We've had uh, well over 2,000 rockets at this point that have been fired at Israel, been fired at Israeli civilians. We have millions of Israelis who have had to go to bomb shelters. It is something that is completely unacceptable, and Israel has to take the steps now to ensure that we restore security and restore deterrence. You now, deterrence is a very amorphic word. How do you restore deterrence? You have to exact such a heavy price from Hamas that they regret not only having started this in the first place, but they think not once, twice, three, four, or five times, ten times before doing something like this in the future. And that's what Israel has been doing, taking out Hamas terrorists, taking out their terrorist infrastructure. We hit their subterranean tunnel network very, very hard, which was an important part of uh, Hamas's war machine. And we're going to continue to prosecute this war until Hamas is deterred. And we will do it, as we always have, taking steps that no other nation has to keep the civilians of our enemy out of harm's way. That's what Israel is doing. How does Israel do that? You saw the example, and many of your viewers have probably seen over the last few days, 15-story buildings collapse. People should ask themselves, if a 15-story building collapses in an urban area, shouldn't you have a lot, a lot of civilian casualties? And you don't. You know why? Because we warn them. We actually call people. We then fire a, uh, a weapon that sort of knocks at the top of the building telling people get out of the building, we give them the time to leave, and then we take out the building because we have no desire to harm innocents on their side. But we are facing in Hamas a terror organization wedded to Israel's destruction that commits day after day, multiple times a day, 2,000 times, they commit a double war crime. They target our civilians by firing rockets indiscriminately into our population center, hoping to kill as many Israelis as possible, and Jews they've killed, they've killed Arabs, it doesn't matter. They want to kill as many of our civilians as possible. But the other thing they do is they embed their terrorist infrastructure in civilian areas. So they place their weapons next to schools, next to uh, mosques, next to hospitals, and they even took over uh, a building, military intelligence of Hamas took over a building where journalists are because they want to use these people as human shields. Well, these are legitimate military targets, and even though they're legitimate military targets, we will take the steps necessary to keep civilians out of harm's way. We are not perfect. No army in the world is perfect. But I would ask Americans who are watching this unfold in Israel, think about this. Our army is fighting this war and surgically going after the terrorists, not thousands of miles away from our shores. It's right on our, in our backyard when our own population is in bomb shelters. So imagine 150, 200 million Americans sitting in bomb shelters. What do you think they'd want their army to do in order to get at the terrorists who are firing rockets at, at them? That's why I think the IDF is using enormous restraint in this conflict, and it's important that the leaders of the world fully support Israel and our right to defend ourselves. And yet some people uh, accuse Israel of disproportionate response. How do you respond to that? I think it's absurd. Disproportionate from what? Look at how other countries faced with similar situations. What was the amount of force that they use? Um, Israel, I think if you look at war, if you speak to experts in warfare, particularly in urban areas, they will be shocked at how much Israel has done to keep the civilians of the enemy out of harm's way. So I don't think we, we have used disproportionate force at all. If we were trying to kill Palestinians, if we were reckless in the use of force, you wouldn't see 100 or 200 people dead. You wouldn't even see 1,000 or 2,000 people. You'd see tens of thousands of Palestinians dead because of the density of the population uh, in Gaza. But we're doing everything we can to just strike at the terrorists. And it's hard because they embed themselves in these civilian areas and they use these people as human shields. And here I have to tell you, Chris, the media has an important role to play because part of Hamas's strategy is to turn the media into enablers for what they're doing. How does it work? They will fire rockets at us. Then when we respond to that rocket fire in those civilian areas and unfortunately make a mistake or there's collateral damage, 
civilians die. Then Hamas wants the entire world to blame Israel. They want governments in the world to restrain Israel, to pressure Israel to agree to their terms. The key to that is the media, because if the media, the media should report on everything, on everything, but they should lay the blame squarely where it belongs, on Hamas. And if they understand Hamas, that the media will not enable them, they will not let them get away with this, with using people as human shields, then they won't do it. If they can get away with it, they will do it. Talk to us about Hamas. Who are they and what are their goals? I mean, a lot of people talk about Hamas, but maybe they may not know the backstory. Who is this uh, group? Well, Hamas is a, <clears throat> a terror organization. They're an Islamic radical group um, that has been uh, around for several decades. They are committed to Israel's destruction and even worse than that, if something could be worse than that, they actually are a genocidal force because their charter calls for the murder of Jews worldwide. They took over Gaza in about 15 years ago, in 2006. Um, they threw out the Palestinian Authority that was then uh, ruling Gaza, and they have used Gaza as a launching pad for attacks against Israel. In the past, they've also perpetrated a couple hundred suicide bombings against Israel where, you know, our buses, you've been here for a long time, so you remember the buses blowing up and, and discos and pizza parlors. Most of those terror attacks were from Hamas. Now they fully control Gaza uh, and they are wedded to our destruction and want to continue to arm, arm themselves in Gaza to get stronger and stronger year after year. And we've had several rounds against uh, Hamas in Gaza. We had it in 2008. We had it in 2012, we had it in 2014, and now we have it in 2021. So it's the fourth time that we've had these cycles with them, and it's important for us to hit them so hard that they will not do this for a very, very long time. And if need be, we may have to take even further steps. Look, Israel didn't want this. Israel didn't initiate this. But once Hamas started it, Israel has to make sure that we exact such a heavy price that they're not going to do it for a very long time to come. There seems to be growing evidence that this is not just a Palestinian group against Israel, but that Hamas has been supplied, armed, and funded by Iran. In what way is this an Iran proxy fighting Israel? Well, there's no question that Iran is, uh, is sitting back and watching this and hoping to see as much violence as possible. There is another terror organization in Gaza. Hamas rules Gaza, but there's another terror organization called Islamic Jihad. They have also launched rockets at Israel. They are a wholly owned subsidiary of Iran. You also have Hamas that is backed by Iran as well. Iran gives them um, uh, weapons. It gives them training. There was an Islamic Jihad spokesman who just the other day was boasting in Arabic media that Iran supplies us with the rockets, they supply us with the expertise, and they supply us with the money. So Hamas is effectively, and Islamic Jihad are serving as proxies of Iran. And you know, Iran is stirring the pot in Iraq, in Syria, in Lebanon, in Yemen, in Gaza. That's all of Iran's terror proxies in the region, which is another reason, Chris, while this is going on in Gaza, we shouldn't lose sight of who the big enemy is, Iran, I hope very much that the administration will not go back, the U.S. administration will not go back into the dangerous nuclear deal with Iran, and they will continue to keep the pressure on that Iranian regime that represents a threat to us, it represents a threat to our Arab neighbors, and it represents a threat to peace throughout the region. How important is it for the U.S. to be backing Israel at this time? And yet we hear some, uh, some comments from U.S. Congress men and women almost uh, seemingly condemning Israel for what they're doing. It's very important for the United States to back Israel. I'm pleased uh, that thus far President Biden has been very strong in backing Israel's right to defend itself. And there were times in the past uh, where we had that support from U.S. administrations. I remember in 2012 when Israel had a very short round. It was about eight days. In 2014, it was about 50 days. And I think one of the differences there was in 2012, we had the full backing of the U.S. administration at the time. And in 2014, it didn't. There was a lot of moral equivalency, a lot of trying to say both sides are at fault. I think when an American president, when U.S. officials are fully backing Israel's right to defend itself, that sends a message to the terrorists that they will not achieve anything diplomatically through their efforts and that in the U.S. is ensuring that the world stands behind Israel. The U.S. holds a very powerful seat on that U.N. Security Council, and they have historically been the protector of Israel in the UN Security Council. And I was pleased, as I said, to hear what President Biden has said thus far. I hope that that will continue in, in the critical days ahead.
You were ambassador uh, for Israel to the U.S. for seven and a half years, uh, and you made a comment recently about the importance of evangelical Christian support for Israel. How important is that for Israel? It's usually important. Uh, you know, the backbone of Israel's support in the world is the United States of America. And the backbone of that backbone are evangelicals, devout Christians who live in the United States. And I saw that I, I made it to 47 out of 50 states during my tenure as ambassador. And throughout America, there is enormous um, wellspring of support among devout Christians for the state of Israel. Uh, and we are deeply appreciative of it, uh, of it. And I hope that Christians will make their voices heard now. I hope that they will call their representatives, tell them how important it is to stand with Israel. Because I can tell you something, Chris, and you've seen this in, uh, around the world. Those people who are the opponents of Israel, they're in the streets. They're waving their flags. They're demonizing Israel. And it's important that the friends of Israel go out there and make clear that they stand with Israel. And I'm, and I'm confident that if they do, that America will stand with Israel. And if America stands with Israel, guess what? Israel will be strong and will be able to get through this as quickly as possible. I've also heard uh, some people, and you addressed moral equivalency. Uh, can you define that? And some people look at this as a tit for tat, you know, and, and you call, already alluded to that, uh, you know, Hamas attacks, Israel responds, and then you lose sight of actually who's the aggressor. Well, I think a lot of people uh, confuse the situation, and that's what the terrorists want. They want to throw a, a cloud around it so that you can't tell the difference. You know that old saying, one man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter? So they want as much moral muddle as possible. They don't want you to make a clear distinction between right and wrong. They want to say both sides are at fault. Both sides are not at fault. On one side, you have a democracy called Israel that values human life, the lives of our own citizens, and also the lives of our enemy civilians. The, those who, who they are using as human shields. On the other side, you have a terror organization that glorifies death, that is trying to kill as many Israelis as possible and doesn't care about their own people. They actually will use them in their propaganda wars. And I don't think any moral equivalency should be made between the, uh, between the two. This is a case of right and wrong. It's good and evil. It's Israel versus Hamas. And it's important to stand strongly with Israel. Final question, Ambassador. Where do you see this going? We're almost eight days into, into this conflict. Uh, what do you see going forward? We didn't start it. So we have um, asserted a goal after it already began, which is, again, to restore security and to hit Hamas very, very hard so that you can restore deterrence, so that they don't fire rockets at Israel in the future. I believe that uh, we've achieved a lot of our military goals. I think the taking out of this subterranean terror network, just so that your viewers understand, they may have heard of these terror tunnels that go from uh, Gaza to Israel. In the last few years, Israel has developed means in order to take out those terror tunnels and essentially block them underground. So we've hopefully, I don't know if it's 100 percent, but we've blocked a lot of those terror tunnels going into Israel. But within Gaza, there is an entire infrastructure of tunnels. It's a subterranean sort of city where Hamas moves from one point to the other. They move their terrorists, they move their arms, they move their missiles, and this was taken out, taken out. Uh, or a good chunk of it was taken out uh, a few days ago. And that's a very, very heavy blow to Hamas. This is something that they were building for years and years and years, maybe spent $100 million, $200, $300 million to do it. And it's important that after we exact this price from Hamas, after we're able to reach a ceasefire, after they've learned their lesson, that when people, when we move towards rehabilitation and rebuilding, that when humanitarian supplies, which Israel always allows into Gaza, when humanitarian supplies go into Gaza, that we not allow the diversion of those supplies to rebuild Hamas's military machine. They were using concrete. They were supposed to go to build schools and to build hospitals, and they were using it to build underground bunkers. Hopefully the world will not again dance to the tune of Hamas, will insist that the supplies that go into Gaza will only be used to build the civilian infrastructure and not to build up uh, Hamas's terrorist military capabilities. Yeah. Ambassador Derma, thanks for joining us. Appreciate Thank you. It.